Good morning. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful, beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So happy to be with you here in worship at Faith Community Church. Uh, I encourage you, as always, friends, to check out the announcements that are printed for you each week in the bulletin. I uh, also want to thank everyone who, in honor or in memory of someone, uh, purchased an Easter lily this year to decorate our chancel area. I encourage you to take those home with you today and share with your families at your Easter table. Would you allow me to call you to worship with prayer? Dear Lord, may we realize in a new way, in a fresh way today, what your death and resurrection mean for us. Forgiveness, freedom, and the ability to walk with you through this fallen world into eternity. May we always find peace and assurance in you and in your willingness to offer yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we make a critical and crucial transition. On Friday, the cross was the means by which God paid the penalty for our sins. A penalty that we could not pay for ourselves, but a penalty that had to be paid to restore us to fellowship with God. And for that, we rightly must be thankful and grateful for what God did through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But as Easter Christians, it's not the cross we celebrate, but the empty tomb. The resurrection is not just the exclamation point after the cross. The resurrection is the guarantee that the work on the cross was acceptable to God in your place. For believers, the resurrection means hope and power and life. Take away Easter and hope dies. Take away Easter and darkness prevails. Take away Easter and all the sorrow and suffering, all the grief and affliction, all the tears and turmoil stand forever unanswered. Take away Easter and death wins. Because if God cannot free Jesus from the tomb, how can there be lasting life, everlasting life for everyone and anyone? The answer is Easter. The message of Easter is that behind all the darkness and death, behind all the sorrow and affliction, behind all the pain and loss that can mark our lives together, stands a love that will not be overcome. The heart of the Easter gospel and the truth from which all of us are called to live is that death may be real. Suffering and sorrow and loss may be real, but they are never final. They will never be the last word about our lives because the risen Christ we encounter is a Christ of love, that is stronger than death. Easter people, raise your voices. Let's stand and sing together. Would you open your hymnals to number 368 and let's join in He Lives.
take a moment to greet one another this morning. How many of you woke up this morning and said, it's Easter? How many of you said, is that my alarm? <laughs> no? Okay, a few. What does Easter mean to you this morning? What are your traditions with your families uh, on this day? Um, or maybe a better question is, what are your traditions about? And. Um, before anybody gets mad at me, I'm not going to bash the Easter Bunny, okay? That's, that's not what I'm here for this morning, but I do want to ask you what this day really means for you. Uh, a few years back, I read about a Sunday school teacher who asked her group of elementary kids what Easter meant to them, and one little girl in the front row immediately raised her hand, I know, I know, I know, and she says, okay, what does Easter mean to you? And she said, it means we're going to eat egg salad sandwiches for the next two weeks. <laughs> Do you still do that? Do you hard boil your eggs and dye your eggs? Yes. Some do. Uh, I have nothing against the little plastic ones full of candy, I will say that, because egg salad is not my thing. But just to be clear, again, I don't have anything against Easter baskets, Easter egg hunts. I certainly appreciate celebrating signs of spring and new life, but for the next few moments together, friends, let's focus on what Easter really means. Uh, that's why we're here. I want to begin by sharing an excerpt from an article. Uh, it was originally printed in Leadership Magazine back in the early 80s, uh, or way back in the 1900s, friends. Um, and you're going to notice the story is a little bit dated by some of the references in it, but uh, that makes it fun. Um, this illustration, however, is so relevant uh, that it seems to show up in publications and on online devotional sites every year at this time. Little Philip. Born with Down syndrome, attended a third grade Sunday school class with several eight-year-old boys and girls. Typical of that age, the children didn't readily accept Philip because he was so very different from them. But because of a creative teacher, they began to care about Philip and accept him as part of the group, though not quite entirely. The Sunday after Easter, the teacher brought legs pantyhose containers. Anybody know what those? I do. Some of the young girls are like, who wears pantyhose in the first place? But Legs pantyhose came in a container shaped like a giant plastic egg. Uh, and each one of the kids receiving one of those pantyhose containers, they were told to go outside. It was a lovely spring day, and they were to find some symbol of new life. And they were to put that inside their egg container and bring it back to the classroom. And... The teacher said, when you bring them back, we're all going to share, uh, like show and tell, in a surprise fashion, we're going to share our new life symbols with one another. 
So after running around the church property in kind of a wild confusion, the students finally returned to the classroom and they placed their containers on the table. (coughs) Surrounded by the kids, the teacher began to open them one at a time. And after each one, whether it was a a flower of some sort or a leaf or, or one of the kids managed to capture a butterfly in that egg that the teacher would open up the egg and the whole class would ooh and ah. And then one was opened revealing nothing inside. And the children immediately shouted, that's stupid, and that's not fair. Somebody didn't do their assignment. Philip immediately spoke up and he said, that's mine. Philip, you don't ever do things right, the students said. There's there's nothing in there. You didn't do the assignment. Philip insisted, I did so do it. I did do it. It's empty because the tomb was empty. Silence in that classroom. From then on, Philip became a full member of that class. The kids finally understood and accepted him and realized that he had so much to teach them. Unfortunately, Philip died not long afterward from an infection that most normal children would have shrugged off. But at his funeral, this class of eight-year-olds marched up front, not with flowers, but with their Sunday school teacher, each to lay on the altar an empty legged pantyhose egg. Philip understood that Easter is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I think in order to understand Easter, to understand why we celebrate an empty tomb, we need to understand why Jesus was in that tomb to start with. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 3, says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We're not getting into heaven for living a sinless life. We, We can't do it. Obeying God's commandments, never transgressing, never thinking bad thoughts about others, never coveting what another person has, never stretching the truth, never telling a lie, never allowing any abusive language to come out of your mouth. We can't do it. None of us can. That's why Paul wrote that we have all sinned. We all fall short of God's standard. We're not getting to heaven on our own merit. There's only one way to heaven, that is through the belief and acceptance that Jesus died for us on the cross. Three days before the resurrection. Redemption is what that is. Jesus died on the cross to redeem us. Uh, This concept of redemption actually is a legal term that they use back in the Old Testament. Things were different in Old Testament days. When times would get tough, people would sell their children or their relatives into slavery for a time uh, until they could make ends meet again and could get enough money that they would go back and redeem or buy back these people. Or sometimes they just had a relative that they would hear about that had somehow been sold into slavery and they would go redeem that person and set them free from bondage. Basically, a redeemer is someone who buys back something that was once theirs, or they would buy someone in order to set them free. So let me give you another example of of what we're talking about here. There was a young boy who handcrafted for himself a little boat, uh, the kind that you take down to the city park and float in the pond, and... uh, he He had made it himself, he painted it, he fixed it up beautifully, he was so proud of it, And one day when he was down at the park, someone stole his boat. Someone took it. And this boy was so upset, just distraught, so distressed. It was one of his most treasured items. Um, But just a short time later, he was passing a pawn shop. And he saw in the window his boat on display. He was so excited, he ran happily into the store approached the pawnbroker there and said, that's my little boat. You can probably guess what the pawnbroker said. He said, no, it's not. It's mine. 
I bought it. And the boy says, well, maybe you bought it, but it's mine because I made it. The pawnbroker says, well, you know, we can fix this. You pay me $2 and you can have it. Well, that boy didn't have $2. It was a lot of money for a little kid that didn't have one penny to his name, but he resolved to have it. So he went home, he asked his parents, his neighbors, anybody in his neighborhood if he could do extra chores for them. He would help cut grass, he would rake leaves, he would wash windows, he would walk the dog, whatever he could do. And soon, he had his money. He ran down, the, ran, ran down to the shop and he said, I want my boat, I want my boat. And he paid the money and he got his boat. And that boy, he, he picked up that boat and he actually hugged it and kissed it and he said, oh, you dear little boat, I love you. You are mine. You are twice mine. I made you, and now I have bought you. That's what God's redemption is. He created us, gave us the free will to choose how to live, and try as we might, friends, all, all of us sin and fall short. We get disconnected, we get separated from God, but he wants us back. And he will do anything. He will give his life for us to find a way back to him. Romans chapter 6 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is redemption. When we accept Jesus' voluntary death on the cross in order to redeem us and place us in a right relationship with God, we are freed from the sin that enslaves us. Another wonderful story for today. Dr. A.J. Gordon was the preacher of a church in Boston in the 1800s. And one day he met a little boy out in front of the church. And the boy was carrying a, a rusty old bird cage in his hands and there were several little birds flooding around on the bottom of the cage, kind of like they knew they were in trouble. <laughs> And Dr. Gordon, the preacher, says to the boy, son, where did you get those birds? And the boy answers by saying, well, I, I trapped them. I caught them out in a field. And the preacher says, well, what are you going to do with them? He says, oh, I'm going to take them home and have a little fun with them. I'm going to play with them, maybe. And the preacher says, well, what are you going to do when you get done playing with them? And he said, the boy says, I, I guess I'll just feed them to the old cat that we have out behind the house. And then Dr. Gordon asked that boy, how much will you take for the birds? And the boy says, Mr., you don't even want these birds. They're just little old field birds. They're ugly and they don't sing. And Dr. Gordon said, you know what? I'll give you $2 for the cage and the birds. Remember, this is in the 1800s, so that $2 will go pretty far. And the guy says, Mr., you're, you're making a bad bargain. He says, no, nope, $2. He says, you got a deal. The exchange was made, and that boy went whistling down the street, happy because he had $2 in his pocket. Dr. Gordon took the cage out behind his church and opened the door of the cage, and the birds flew out, soaring away into the sky, singing as they went. The next Sunday, Dr. Gordon took that empty bird cage to the pulpit to use in illustrating his sermon. He said, you know, that little boy said that these birds didn't sing. But when I released them from the cage, they went singing away into the blue, and it seems they were singing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Those birds were bound for death with that little boy, but when the pastor bought them and released them, they had been redeemed. They had been set free from that bondage in the cage. Can you see that? Do you hear it? Do you feel that this morning? We're in bondage to our sins. We are in need of redemption. That's what Jesus did on the cross that Friday. He sacrificed himself in order to redeem you and me. We're like those little birds caged up with our sin, bound for death, eternal separation from God without our Redeemer. I want you to wake up in the morning thanking God that you have a Redeemer. His name is Jesus. Jesus redeemed us on the cross. 
Scripture tells us that after Jesus had died, he was removed from the cross, placed in a tomb that was sealed with a very large boulder rolled over the opening. And on Sunday, some women came to anoint Jesus' body with oils and spices, as that was their custom in the day. As they're walking and talking, they're wondering, how are we going to get into the tomb? Um, they, they know there's been a stone rolled over the entrance, and I imagine they're discussing how to approach the Roman soldiers to ask them to move that very large rock so they can get in and anoint Jesus' body. I want to look at uh, the Gospel of Mark, his account of this event. I'm in chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they look up and they saw that stone, which was very large, it had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Friends, that's what Easter is all about. He is risen from the dead. That's what sets Christianity apart from all the other world religions. They worship and listen to the teachings of dead people. We worship and serve and listen to a living God, one who loved us so much he was willing to die for us. One of the most memorized and loved passages in the Bible, John 3.16, we use it a lot around here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God died for us on the cross and then to show us his power and to assure us that we will have life after death, he defeated the grave. The tomb was empty. Jesus conquered the grave and he's waiting for you to just accept what he did for you. He wants to redeem you this morning. In the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 19, Job says, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. I am overwhelmed at the thought. We should be overwhelmed at the meaning of Easter. God loved us so much he sent his son Jesus to redeem us and bring us back to him. I want you to be overwhelmed at the thought of that. And I want you to share it. I've got one more story for you this morning. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. When I chose this to share with you today, my prayer was that it would nudge you, that it would speak to you. It was almost one o'clock in the morning when the phone rang. Dr. Leo Winters, who was a highly acclaimed Chicago surgeon, was abruptly awakened. There had been an accident and his very skilled hands were needed for immediate surgery at the hospital. The quickest route happened to be through a rather tough area of town, but with time being a critical factor, it was worth the risk. So he got in the car and headed for the hospital. At one of the stoplights, his door was yanked open by a man in a gray hat and a dirty flannel shirt. The guy says, I need your car, grabs him by the collar and jerks him out of the car. Dr. Winters is, is trying to explain the gravity of the situation, where he's going, what he's doing, but the man won't listen. He gets in the car and speeds away. When the doctor was finally able to get a taxi to the hospital, over an hour, had gone by and it was too late. Um, the patient had passed away 30 minutes earlier. 
The nurse told the doctor that the father of the victim had gone to the chapel wondering why the doctor never came. Dr. Winters walked hurriedly to get to the chapel, and when he entered, he saw the victim's father, a man who was wearing a gray hat and a dirty flannel shirt. Tragically, he had pushed away the one who could save his son. And you're going to say, wow, Pastor Jennifer, that, that's so sad, right? That's no happy ending there. That's kind of a, a rough one to put in your Easter sermon this morning. Easter's about the happy ending, right? Here's the thing. Friends, there are scores of people every day who push from their lives the very one who can save them from the penalty and the power of their sin. Countless numbers turn away from the one who can save them from their emptiness and their confusion and their hopelessness. They're too busy for the one who can deliver them from a meaningless life. They've got other things they think are more important than the one who is willing to sacrifice everything to save them. They can't seem to find time for the one who can redeem them. It is sad. It's tragic. Because things could be so different. If only someone would have told that man in the gray hat and the dirty flannel shirt, hey, don't carjack the doctor who can save your kid. If only that man would have listened when the doctor tried to explain who he was and where he was going, what he was doing. Don't throw away the one you need. It seems so obvious when we hear this story, it almost hurts. It does hurt. So why do we hold back? Why do we hold back from telling others, please don't push aside the one who can save your life? Why do we watch it happen? Christ is the Savior that we all desperately need. Jesus is the one who can change the story, change it to have the most glorious, happy ending in all eternity. That is why we celebrate Easter. Won't you let others know why you rejoice today? Friends, let's take a few moments to go to our Lord in prayer this morning. God, our Father, on this glorious Easter day, we come together to offer praise and adoration for Jesus. Jesus risen, alive, powerful, and victorious, the salvation of the world. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thank you for bringing us here to this place, uh, for calling us into the fellowship of those who trust in Christ and seek to obey his will. And Lord, we lift up your church today, celebrating in clusters and crowds all over the world. Our backgrounds may be different, our lives may be different, but our worship is one. Our praise for you is united. Hear us today, Lord, as we pray for one another and, and for ourselves. We have so much to celebrate today. We are overwhelmed, Lord, at the thought. <clears throat> We know that there are still those among us and around us uh, who may be hurting. Shine your light. Shine your light, Lord, in those places of darkness. Uh, reveal your presence to those who may be weak or sick or dying or broken. Bring your comfort. Bring your peace. Provide for those in need, those with a lack of food or shelter or work or love. Guide those who are lost. We seek your forgiveness, Lord, your grace, your mercy, your justice, and we pray for healing. Hear us. Hear us today, God, as we shout with our hearts, boldly bringing to you uh, the faces in our mind's eye, the places, the names, the situations. Hear us. God, we want your 
attention. We want your intervention. We want your counsel. And we also pause now, Lord, to hear you. Would you put those names on our hearts, those needs, would you put that on our radar, those that we need to see, to truly see, those you enlist us to care for in your name. Show us who, show us what you have in store for us and how we can serve, how we can help, and how we can love. Lord, for our families, our friends, our community, our church, our country, our world, and our place in our world, hear our prayers today. Grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. And it is with great hope and anticipation we pray that our risen Savior may fill us with the joy of his glorious and life-giving resurrection. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'd like to invite the choir to come forward.
I'd like to add just another verse to the scripture that I shared with you earlier from the book of Mark. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Friends, have you ever wondered if the Easter story could have gone just a bit differently? Um, maybe something like uh, you get there and the angel says, He is risen! And look, there he is! And we run over and we hug Jesus and there's cries of amazement and tears of joy and they're dancing. The DJ shows up, we order pizza and it's a celebration right there because he's risen and he's standing there. Instead, the announcement was, he is not here. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. I was that kid that always says, wait, what? He's not here. He's risen and he's not here. But notice, friends, there is no invitation to stay at the tomb. The invitation is to go and follow where Jesus is leading. I said earlier that as Easter Christians, we celebrate an empty tomb today, and we do, but let's not make a shrine of that tomb. Let's not turn the stone into a potential object of adoration. This isn't where we're supposed to stay. We need to be following the risen Lord. As Mark's gospel comes quickly to a close, we're directed away from the tomb to realize that the story hasn't ended. Instead, the story continues in the lives of everyone who will follow Jesus into the world. It's as if the resurrection is opening a doorway to an entirely new life that is yet to unfold for Jesus' followers, and that includes all of us. Today, because Jesus has risen, your life can take a new course and have a new purpose. Thanks be to God. I would like to offer special thanks to our choir this morning, to Sue, to Joanne, Laura Hanna on the trumpet for all of your hard work. You have blessed us and we thank God for your giftedness this morning. I'll ask you all to stand and receive the Lord's benediction. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the celebration of the resurrected life bring new hope to your being. May the victory over earthly death turn your eyes to the promises of heaven. May the empty tomb help you to leave your sorrows at the foot of the cross, so that God's hope, God's promises, and God's forgiveness reign in your life forever and always. Amen. Would you join in our closing hymn this morning, number 367, Christ the Lord is risen today.